just to build a bridge. All that we established by the grace of God for service, we're able to talk about the fact that God will create opportunities and He will give chances. But that one of the major characteristics of such opportunities is that they don't come with announcements, right? So we use the story of uh, Rebecca marrying Isaac. We talked about David conquering Goliath. When they woke up in the morning, it didn't look like anything mighty was going to happen that day. And there are stories upon stories in the Bible like that when uh, somehow God will answer people's prayer and it will bring glory, opportunity, golden moment to, to their doorstep without any announcement. Even Joseph who could see things in the dream, a night to the time will be called from the dungeon to interpret Pharaoh's dream. He had no clue. He did not receive any vision. That means many things will happen without a voice, without a prophetic word, but God has a way of preparing you not to miss opportunities, even though there is no voice, no dream, no vision. And these are the things we are looking at. What are the things that a saint should know? That the day there is a divine set up for you, you will not miss it. If David said, I'm not going to give my brothers food, I'm not going to take food to my brothers, he wouldn't have known till today. The story of David and Goliath is what is being talked about across the nations. Even non-Christians know that story, but the story started with an ordinary day. Your brothers are walking somewhere fighting for the king. Go give them food. For every no you say to some little things, do you know some big things we are missing? How then do we get ready? So there are principles in God, instructions in the Bible, that even though you are not hearing anything, even though you are not seeing anything, once God provides an opportunity for you, you will not miss it. And we started with the first one, that is in Proverbs 22, 29. You can have your seat. God bless you. So let's rush. Proverbs 22, 29. Bible says, See thou a man that is diligent in his business. Everybody write it down. Number one, say diligence. There is a place in God reserved for people that are this. So Solomon said it this way. Ecclesiastes 11, 6. It's a better rendering. In the morning. Oh, this sounds like a motivation, but it's not. It's a prophetic word. Too many Christians are like pendulum. See, if you, the Bible says for instance that those who are planted in the house of God will flourish in the court of the king. Planted means that you are there every time you should be there. Now, this guy said, or Solomon said, in the morning, or the scripture, not, sow your seed. In the evening, do not withhold your hand. This is the mystery in God. He said, you don't know which one. However, if you are always planting your seed in the morning and always planting in the evening, whether God is coming in the morning or in the evening, you will not miss God. So you are going to see a lot of people in the Bible that God helped them to collide with God's opportunity by following the principle of diligence. I end the first service this way. Listen, check from, and I said that God is universal. When it comes to worshiping God, in spirit and in truth, only Christian can do that. When it comes to God's benevolence to all humanity, there is a principle. For instance, you don't have to be a Christian to help the poor. When you help the poor, there is a portion of God's blessing that goes to you. If you are truthful, whether you are an atheist or if you are a man that says the truth, you are very honest to yourself, not that you push the truth on others, to yourself and to every other point. There is a measure of divine blessing that goes with a man of truth. If you are a faithful man, the same way if you're a diligent man, there is a support from God that comes because you are following one of the eternal principles of God, diligence. Yes, but that law demands consistency. Somehow, when people start business, when people are working, when people in the family or need anything, and they begin to pray, angels working with you under the instruction of God begin to arrange events but the tragedy is that many times, many times, people miss the opportunity that God, I remember this very, very terrible story that somebody told me. Here is a lady that she was fasting and troubling the pastor to join her in praying about opportunity to travel abroad many, many years ago. One remote church, in maybe one of the Southeast or so, one remote, praying and trusting God. 
And then there was a day. She said she was depressed and she stayed at home. She was part of the choir. I don't know whether it was wrong, Kenon or so that came. Somebody was able to somehow got, get him to their church. And he was shocked that that small church, the choir could sing like that. And he said that he was going to take all the entire choir abroad. All of them that day, his P only had that day to attend to them. And I think they said he took their name and this girl was not there. The rest were not even planning to travel. She was one planning. God is not wicked. In Jordan, you must understand the nature of God. That when he tells you to do something, at times God does as if he's forgotten. But the master is coming one day. But he's sure that if you are diligently doing what he has said, whether it comes in the afternoon or in the evening, you will not miss. The story, almost there will be a day that quantum leap We happen to every business. A quantum leap. That means in like profit of 10K a day, 5K a day, 10K a day, 5K. It can go on like that for a while. One guy comes one day, either a suggestion or a transaction in your office that changes everything. May you not miss that one person and that one golden moment. Yeah. I'm a pastor, even from the story of great churches. It is always that one meeting we have one day, one meeting you will have one day, and that meeting will change the destiny of that church. But you see, if you are not a diligent person, how do you know which of the meetings? That means law of diligence demands that treat every opportunity to do what you are doing, do it well. So the Bible says, whatever thy hand find there, do it. See, hey, a sister here did an interior deco for somebody. They look like old man and woman who did not even have money to pay. One or one old house. Just somebody here. And she, 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 she said right now. She just did this thing for them. And the day she went to give them and they were looking at it, two of their sons living abroad came and they were big shots. They told her, this happened just some weeks ago, they told her, you did this. Can you come and be doing this for us in America? Your flight and everything. The first you told us, I don't plan to live in America. Me and my husband want to stay in Nigeria. So we are not asking you to come and leave. We take care of your visa and everything. We have great jobs over there. Nobody says no to us. We bring, bring you to do this work and you come back to Nigeria and you charge any amount. Any good thing you have started doing, be diligent. Any good thing that you have started doing. One of the reasons why God even arrested Apostle Paul, he was very diligent about persecuting the Christian. Somehow, Everyone lost people that when they set out, they go all the way. Too many Christians start something. They, if, you, if you believe that you want to set up an office or do something and you start, please, if you go for evangelism every Friday, stick to it. Somehow, if you look at the important things that God created on that, imagine your heart going on vacation or the air we breathe in. Saying that, well, let them use um, oxygen is tired for a while, nitrogen replace for like a <laughs> for like just a day. Everybody's gone. The important things that God created. Have you seen the day? See, even the, Noah said, what God said to Noah in Genesis, a why the earth remain, see time and harvest. You will always have day and night, every day. The Almighty is sending a message to humanity that one of the attributes of God is consistency. Diligence. You know, saints, that's why you can write this down. I am not a Jew. I'm not a very old man. As a matter of fact, I'm a young man. But take this from me. It's a statement gathered from the Bible. It's, or it's a mentality got it from the Bible. Listen to me, every, everybody. A Christian who fasts for two times a week, let's say Monday and Wednesday, until five o'clock or six, every week, we do better than the one that goes to do seven days dry once in a while. Write it down. Take that from me. See, God gave me grace from GSS 3 to start preaching. Scripture, you know, I was the president of my fellowship and they said in the university, I have observed Christians. Some of the people that did acrobatics when we were in school till today are not even, they are not believers. I do dry at times. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying to everybody that somehow the principles of the kingdom, they support a man who is consistent than a man if you wake up 5.30 every morning to pray till 6 
Chances are that you will be better than a Christian who once in a while prays for three hours. In three hours, we shock him. He will come out. But you see, somehow, when you, cont- when you start devotion, and you know that your energy can only do 30 minutes, 6, 5.30 to 6, and you're always there, you have created a channel in the spirit through which God can reach you. What will happen is this. Many times, when a golden moment is coming, you might not be able to pick it, you might not know it, but as you pray in the morning, that's why you pray to God will sit with us somehow. The language you are speaking in tongues is praying that you should not miss the opportunity that is coming in the day. Yes. So somebody can say, I'm going to take you to those place and disappoint you so that you can be at home because you are supposed to be at home at that time. Now, when you were saying that, Lee, Kratu, Zekira, Ishti, you thought that you were saying that, Lord, heal my mom. Kalibo, Lord, touch mommy. Let's take her back like Isa. But you see, Lord, touch my mom. What's your prayer? The Spirit was saying that, and today, they will not pick you up so that you can be at home. Because you need to be at home by 6 p.m. Because somebody is coming. And that person is an answer to your prayer. Do you get what I've just said now? We are going to look at stories in the Bible about the Bible. I will mention them before, then we break them down as time permits. The second thing is charity. Write it down. If you are practicing this thing regularly, whichever way God shows up, whichever way He arranges opportunity for you, you will not miss it. Charity. You know, the Bible talks a lot about that. Ah, let's read the version of, and I will tell you something from David, Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 from verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. That word brotherly love is the word Philadelphia. That's the meaning. When Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3, I have said before you an open door. Jesus was actually saying that any Christian, now we don't have the names of those churches here. Now, in fact, those churches now it's not, it's not an Islam dominated area. It's not a, so Jesus was prophetically talking about seven types of Christian. There are the seven types of churches we find. And he said that the one that has unlimited open door, he said Philadelphia, he said to the church, that means Jesus was saying that to the church that works in brotherly love, to a Christian that understands brotherly love, a door is open perpetually before you, and no man can shut it. And Paul began to explain more. Or whoever wrote Hebrew, there's a contention about whether Paul wrote Hebrew. Continue on this line. Go back to that Hebrews 13. Now look at verse 2. He started touching on very crucial stuff. Listen to me. There's no room for selfishness in the kingdom of God. Ah. I'm going to show you what it means when you reach out to a stranger. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You know, Lot was living in disobedience. But the way he attracted the angels to his house, something happened that day. Verse 3. Remember them that are bound, as bound with them. He says some without knowing he said, do not forget strangers. Because many times on the day of your breakthrough, the Lord comes as a stranger. There is a story that shows this. If you're under the sound of my voice, you are praying, you are pursuing things, trusting God, demonstrating faith, and it's like you are missing it. It's not forthcoming. It is because you are not paying attention to strangers around you. And I will show you in a while. Look at the story of David. An example of a man that prayed. 1 Samuel 30. Captivity do up, they happen, things like that they happen at times. A moment that looks like you are going through a kind of defeat. And now, David went to war. Before he came back, the Amalekites had captured his family. How many of you know the story? Like any other man, David cried. They burned him with fire. Verse 2. I'll be very fast on this verse. Verse 2. And they are taking women captive. They were, they, there's no not any. God is always, you know, there is this preservation. God allowed them, but they did not touch anybody. And they are not raped any woman. But they capture all the women. They carried them away and went their way. Verse 3. So David and his men came. Their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Next verse. 
Then David and the people, they were with him. They cried until, as this happened to you before, they cried until they could not cry again. And then, long and short of it, David prayed. And God said, pursue, overtake, and you shall recover all. But I want to go to verse 6 or verse 8. Go down to which verse now? 12, 13, where they met an Egyptian. Please pay attention that this is very deep. Now, who invaded their country? Do you remember? Who invaded their country or their town? Say it, say it if you are bold. Again. So who, who should they be looking for? David cried, then he started up, and God said, pursue, overtake, and recover. There are people here, you hear a pastor give a word, you say amen. You pray on your own, you receive a word, you say amen. You have scriptural promises, but you are wondering, when will they translate into something? David got a word from God, but you see, God will not say this because he has trained you to understand it. David had pursue, overtake, and recover. You will think that he will be looking for Amalekites. He was rushing. When do we catch up with them? When do we catch up with them? Now, the first thing they saw, as they were rushing, remember, your wife, your daughters, everybody with the people. So every minute counts. What I said in the morning, ah, when we calm down, our eyes will see more. Even when you rest very well, your eyes can see your notes. And there's a Yoruba day that says that, that when the eye calms down, you can see the notes. Especially in a city like Lagos, New York, all those busy places, Ori Ori is making a lot of people to miss God's opportunity. At times you ask a killer and lake you know. Look at the one I said for service. All of us are guilty of this. There's no church you go to that you will not see this. As service ends, you'll see the crowd who don't have cars standing. Those of us with cars, at times we are the only one in your car. Zoom. It's not that you are bad. It, it, for in some cases, it does not even occur to us that we can pick any of those people. And for some people, what's the excuse not doing so? You want to pick somebody, he stole something from your car. One of the questions we have to answer before God on that day is that should the bad behavior of people stop you from being a good person? Should the stinging nature, nature of a scorpion stop the saving nature of if you are a good person? And you let your good diminish because of bad people repaying you with evil. You are falling to what the Bible says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. When people do evil to you and you respond by cutting down the good you do, what you have done that you have responded, you have been overcome with evil. I know it can be tough, like I said, for service. In a church in Oregon, the woman just picked up somebody who just left the church and stood opposite the road. She picked up the guy. Before they got to her daughter, I brought her pistol and robbed her in the car. But the question would be, should I now take a decision? How many men of God have failed God? Why hasn't God shut down churches? Is there any bad thing that pastors have not done before? I minister to girls raised by their pastor. When we go give up on man, our rebellion against God, why has it? You cannot let the wicked win. It is painful when we do good and they hurt us. It's very painful. At least I have a bit of experience in people living, what you can go through, people live with you. If I got married, 11 guys were staying with me. Everyone that finished from you, where I finished from, that I don't have a job. Maybe they came to Lagos for an interview, white pen waiting, they would just stay with me. I will become 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And I've, I've said it there before. Since I got married till now, myself and my wife, we have never stayed in our house alone. We have never slept one night as only me and I alone. Many times, six, seven people, and no relative of mine or ours, nobody comes to stay with us in our family. Not that we don't want them. They just, they, they are not interested. I'm very close to my sibling. They can come and visit, but they will go back the same day. And I'm the last one. I have two boys. I have to get two, two ladies. My two brothers will come visit. They will go. Neither have I slept in the house also. But we are very close. We can just all day long. Thank God for that. My parents will come to Lagos. They will only call you after they've left. Yes. My father only passed a night one, one day like that. We just got married then. And we compared him to stay. So we gave him our room. 
I went to lie down in the sitting room. She slept in another room like that. When my father woke up and he got to the room and he gave me his room, the way he scolded him, you would think I did something more terrible. He said, never. He said, that room is for you and your wife. I would have slept anywhere. He said, I love my parents. My mom has never called to give her issue once. And we are three guys, my two other brothers. My mom has never given anyone. She's not interested in. If my mom comes to your house, obey, she came to babysit for us. She sits down. If you are watching CNN, even if all of you leave, my mom will not change the channel. Ask my wife and ask the two other wives. They, they, all, they, all, they always want her to come. She will not. Mom, what do you want to eat? What are you planning to cook for the whole house? Yeah. There's some people are looking at you, know that. Uh, um, <laughs> you see, your mom might be hard. Love her all the same. But I've always said this to men. It's your duty to create peace between your wife and your mom. If they're having issues, you are the problem. You know that some mothers are overbed. They can be very, maybe they raise the boy alone. There is a bit of a mentality that maybe you are the last born and everything. But see, you should be a man in love. You know your mom now. That her mommy is that will come to the house and sit over everything. She's not a bad person. That is who she is. But it's your duty to create. You don't let that happen. Yes. I know that your wife also, she's, she's uh, Margaret Thatcher. I mean, she, she go talk. So why are you allowing? Then you know the two of them. You should create peace and not let them have too much. Visit mommy and leave. Don't leave her alone with mommy. <laughs> you are the man. You are not to forsake your mom, but at times you can even begin to teach your mommy. See, this generation, say something that will let her start calming down. Because I see, as a pastor, most of the issues are presided over. No direct conflict between the man and the wife. It's always the man's younger brother who comes to stay, or the mom that begins the trouble. I call one boy like that. He don't want that or that's come and meet me in the office here. That she want the brother's wife. I said, so what happened? She said, he said that she served him food. He finished eating, he dropped the plate, and the lady just, she said it polite that, ah, she even called him uncle that maybe you should wash your plates. And he look at it, maybe he expected him to say, ah, <laughs> call her for me. And uh, honestly, walking by, I said, are you all right? <laughs> so who should wash the plates? You are a bachelor, you live alone. When you finish in your house, she cooked for you, she even served you. You know, the mentality, my brother's house. If you are a guy here, your brother's house, once your brother marries, is their house. The two of them. And a wise man should tell you that straight away. I love you as my brother. You are still my brother. But you see, two have become one. You know, people are listening to me. They are finding it difficult to accept what I've just said now. Now my brother. <laughs> no problem. It's, I don't blame guys like this. It's you lady marrying them that I blame. You should know now. No, it's true. Because certain people will not change some things they do. Some families, even if they all, if they all become professors, it does not shift the idea they have to. They bleed out. Any woman their son marries is a potential mate. There is caller, there is dio, there is chinedu. Let me use two tribes. There is uh, uh, a maker. When a maker is doing, a maker's wife, a maker's son is clocking uh, 10, they expect it to go there and cook. You see where they harass people. Your brother, say your, uh, your brother-in-law did a party and you were not there. Do I have to be there? There's nobody in my family that has such questions, and I thank God. Even if you see me, blessed be the name of the Lord. I am I'm representing my wife. Nobody can say, oh, you are here, why is your wife? I said, they say, joking, ah, where is your wife? But to start saying that, hey, we are doing a family function, where is your wife? So she can come and help you, Dan I mean, that, that. <laughs> And you did not give me one out of the bad price. Sorry, I will let you know that. I'm sorry, uh, cousin. She's not our wife. She's my wife. Let's get that straight. I check it very well. People who do that, when they are female children, they don't let them, they don't allow anybody to do that to their own children. Let me just tell you this story. <laughs> the 
No worry, we'll continue next week. They found, who did they find? Who were they looking for? Thank God. Remember, the Bible says, do not forget to entertain stranger. Now, see what happened. They found, they gave him bread. And he did eat. When they brought him to David, the reaction of a natural man would have been, excuse me, what's my business with an Egyptian? Every minute counts. We are rushing. Like we rush in Lagos. We are rushing. But they did not know that this guy was the answer to their prayer. Remember, they were just going by faith. They didn't even know which direction those people went through. Then David said, bring this guy. In the midst of their desperation to recover their family, time going, they still had enough time to attend to a stranger. And they gave him bread, cake, and water. And they said, who are you? Next verse. When he revived, because he had no eating for three days and three nights. Next verse. David said to him, who do you belong to? Then he said, I'm a young Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. My master left me. That was the undo of these guys. Why did they leave him? He was sick. If you are always pushing away people who are weak, who are poor, away from you, you will lose a lot in life. Let's forget for a moment that God was helping David. This was how these people, they would have successfully, they would have carried away those things successfully. They were exposed because he was sick and the boss pushed him down. I don't want people like you here. But somebody else picked him up. And when he told them, he said, we're the ones that invaded. He didn't even know who David was. He just said that we are come from so-so I became sick and they dropped me. And David said, where are they? And he knew where they were going to. He just said so-so And that was how they were able to recover. You see? But the, what God gave them, he said, pursue, overtake, and recover. When Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, the Bible said he appeared as a stranger. And they were talking about resurrection. And they did not know that it was the Lord that was by their side. Look at what happened in that Luke 24. As they got to where they were going, Jesus did as if he was going away like an homeless man. And one of them begged him that it's too late, stay with us. It was when he stayed with them that he gave them bread and their eyes opened and saw that it was Jesus Christ. What about if they did not compel him to stay with them that night? Men and brethren, the old secret of Job in Job 29 was that he said that the secret of God shine. Now, this is where I want to hang this message today. Secret of God. Job 29. Hallelujah. Remember, the secret thing belongs to God. And I said that when God sent his opportunity, they come like on a day that you are not expecting it. But secretly, God can prepare you that you will know. Because you can have access to God's secrets. Job continues his parable and said, verse 2, all that were as the month passed, as the days when God preserved me. Verse 3. When his candle shine upon my head, when by his light I walk through darkness, there is a way that light guides you continually. Verse 3. Verse, verse 4, sorry. Fast, fast. I was in the days of my youth when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. And Job started listening. I was eyes to the blind. As a young man, Job became so wealthy and he was divinely protected. And he said, because he had my secrets, I started helping people. He said, the blessing of somebody that was going away, I sustained. I refuse to rejoice when anybody's falling. I help. Ah. Mm. Thank God for prophecy and everything. This is why from this moment onward, the body of Christ must go a lot into charity. According to be done with wisdom. We need to live very funny about it. Once the church is giving people, everybody becomes needy. <laughs> so it has to be done carefully. But most importantly, individual members of the church, where we live, when they talk about charity, and your heart goes to your head, they should give to me. That is selfishness. When you hear a message like this, it begins with, even in the little corner where I am, what can I do? Even if I don't have cash to give people, you have good words, support, being there for people. Sometimes people are sick and there's nobody around them. Sometimes people are lonely. 
and there's no body. See, we get to a point where nobody comes to church on Sunday and goes back without eating or goes away. Because sincerely speaking, all the things in the world, they are in surplus. But human beings are always hoarding. Yeah. There are individuals in certain nations that are richer than Nigeria. It's at the resources that you have staying with some few people. And the Lord believes in you reaching out. Charity is a big deal with God, especially to strangers. Strangers. You can be like the Samaritan, or you can be like the Levites, or the priests. He saw the wounded guy passed. We will always have reason to pass people by. The Levite was not a wicked man. The priest was not a wicked man. They had reason that made them to look too busy to carry a dead a man that was dying. But a Samaritan. Many times we have reasons why we don't want to reach out. Somebody has hurt, somebody repaid you evil for good. Oh, I have very little money. I don't even have enough for myself. And all those excuses that we have for not reaching out to people. I want to stop here. Charity. You know, one of the estates in Mawe, Mawe of Father, those say the outside, like one of the estates, a man with hectares upon hectares of land told my friend the story that he got it. He was rushing to Ibadan and he saw this old man carrying stick with his son. One of the, one of the, a, 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 a downpour was, I mean, a very heavy rain coming down in torrents. He said, of course, it was on 120, he had passed. He said, but he just felt in his heart that, ah, he looked at his tushka. Is it where they would put the firewood and the colors and the hole? He said, but he made up his heart that no. He went ahead, he stopped, meters away and reversed and picked the man and the boy. They were just going to a village up the road. When he drove, they were, Baba said, come, come back here. Many years ago. And he told him, I think he took him to the ballet first and told him that, see, all this road, all this, all this land to the express, that we own it. Hectares upon hectares. I know he said, you know what he told the guy? He gave the guy everything. That's where some estates are sitting today. You are praying for God to bless you, but it comes like a stranger. God is not coming through the contract you are breaking your head over. That you are anointing the fire until the old fire. In fact, the reason why they are rejecting you is that too much oil on the fire. Oh, Lua, and then you put it down. And the Lord is saying that the total money in this contract you are writing is less than 10 million. Do you know God's thought towards you? There's nothing you desire in life, no request that is up to one over 100 of what God plans for you. God is big, man, and he thinks big of you. He created one man, Adam, surrounded with four rivers with gold. That's the nature of God. Shortage is not part of his plan. Let's rise. What a service. I am so certain that God has visited you in a very special way. And you have testimonies to share. You can do that by sending an email to testimonies at householdofdavid.org. And if you joined the service and you've not given your life to Christ or you're not sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ, I would like to lead you in a very simple prayer. I'd like you to say after me, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want you to take preeminent control of everything that has to do with me. Become my Lord and become my Savior. Hence, I declare from this moment forward, I am no longer a sinner but I am a child of God. The Jesus Christ is Lord of my life in Jesus' precious name. Now, if you said that prayer after me, would like you to send an email to the email that is being displayed on the screen and the number, or you can send a text message to the number that you see on the screen. If you'd like to follow us in the household of David, you can visit any of our social media platforms or our website and know a lot more about us. We would also want to know about you and would like to hear from you. Um, till next time, I would like to say keep living in an atmosphere 
of God's mercies and God bless you. Get ready for a very phenomenal and a remarkable week. God bless you.